I am doing really well, Giovanni. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you again for giving me this chance to uh, have this interview. And uh, uh, and I wanted to start with a little bit about your, your background for those who haven't heard from, from you uh, as much. Um, for everyone in, in, in the county, Montgomery County, Maryland, you, you were first elected in, in 2010, correct? That's correct? Yes, about 11 years now. I've been on the county council. I'm in my third term. So we have four-year terms and mm -hmm. I've been reelected three times. Great. And, and uh, you have a long-standing history of uh, working uh, with progressive uh, um, uh, ideals, priorities, um, policies that um, benefit our uh, communities in, in Montgomery County. Um, some of my notes uh, I'm, I'm looking into is uh, uh, you founded a nonprofit youth organization uh, called the, uh, the 2030 Center to Save Social Security from Privatization. Uh, you also were very active on health, allowing uh, young adults to remain on their parents' health care plans during, uh, until age 25, which later became a key provision of the Obamacare as well. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, mention you also are married to Angela Walker, uh, married in, 2000, uh, I'm sorry, in 1998, on 2002, correct? Is that correct? 2002, yeah. 2002, and uh, settled in Silver Spring. Uh, and uh, she's also in, in policy, is that correct? She's also, uh, uh, she was an executive director of the Congressional Black Caucus Poli uh, Political Committee, is that correct? That's correct, that's correct. And now she works for Pfizer. So she's been working on the vaccination campaign rollout that's over this wonderful. past year. Wonderful. And then uh, uh, you were, we worked a lot on voter rights in 2007, um, campaigning as the National Youth Vote Director. And in education, you also fought for education opportunities from pre-K through higher education. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, you have been working about the spectrum and with uh, progressive policies. But tell, tell you a little bit more about why you're deciding to, to run in this case for, for executive, for executive uh, the uh, county. Thank you. Well, Montgomery County is a great place to live. It's a wonderful community. Um, we have a lot of progress over many decades that has built what is really a very special place. But uh, I think a lot of us are concerned that the amount of new jobs that are being created, the amount of new housing that's being created is not enough to support the quality of life for the community. And we need to really face forward in this county and uh, adopt policies that are gonna support the well-being of our community uh, in the future. And I think I am concerned, a lot of us are concerned that the Montgomery County government is, is not making enough progress, that we're, you know, the, the leadership is not strong enough. And, and in many ways we're, we're moving too slowly or we're stuck. And the, the problems that are arising as a result, uh, that there aren't enough new jobs being created every year, that housing is becoming very expensive. It's very hard for people to be able to live in Montgomery County. Uh, those are problems that we could do a better job uh, trying to solve. And so uh, I would like to have the chance to work on those issues and to make Montgomery County a, a place where we feel you know, very proud to live and, and proud of the leadership in the community and, and where more and more people are part of the solution and working together for the future of the county. So, uh, you know, jobs, housing, transportation, education, police, you know, these are all very important issues for the community. And we need to, we need to work harder and, and reach higher. Right, and uh, these are very challenging times. Before we go to uh, the details on, on uh, the different aspects you're gonna focus on or, or prioritize uh, if, if you become elected, um, these are very challenging times and uh, for the county as well. We then uh, had issues with the Purple Line due to, to COVID, everything is, is stalled. Uh, also, there were a lot of uh, uh, issues with the construction company between the construction co company and the, and the state of Maryland. And, uh, well, there were some uh, uh, issues there, but now it, the, the uh, Purple Line is, is moving forward. 
this is also this is going to be also one of the priorities to finish the purple line, uh, make this happen. This is going to be really important for the for the economy. Yes, the purple line is so exciting because it's going to create a whole corridor from Bethesda all the way across Silver Spring to College Park, um, the, you know, the university there, and then on to Amtrak, connecting ultimately to New York. It's going to be a very powerful corridor for Montgomery County and a place where we can really grow. Um, but we want to make sure that the Purple Line, that area will be affordable, you know, so that people will be able to be able to live there. Uh, it'll be walkable and safe and uh, that there'll be more housing and, uh, and there'll be more jobs. Mm -hmm. And one of the big disagreements I've had with the county executive is he proposed to make the trains single track. Um, so when they come into Bethesda, instead of having one train going in each direction to have to, to only have one track. And then so one train can come in and then it has to come out before the next train can go in. Um, you know, I think those of us who who ride Metro know what single tracking means. It means slow trains and delay. Or if you're merging, you know, in a highway, you, you have two lanes that go to one lane. It means bottlenecks and delays. And I'm very upset about the idea of taking the purple line, which should be an economic engine and you know, a prosperity engine for the county, and then diminishing that by single tracking it into Bethesda. So one of my strong priorities is let's get the purple line finished, let's get it done right, and let's make sure that that whole corridor all along the purple line is a place that this county we'll be able to look to for our future growth and our future success. And we've got a lot of investment that we need to make, a lot of uh, fixes to the roads, you know, improvements to housing in order to make that possible. But that's a big priority for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm very excited about connecting to the university. You know, the University of Maryland is there along the Purple Line. Montgomery College is there along the Purple Line. And then into Bethesda, you've got federal laboratories like the National Institutes of Health and NOAA, the Weather Agency. So all of those institutions could be working together in a very powerful way to support our future prosperity. That's what I'd like to work on. Right. And there's something really important to also mention um, that it's going to bring, if, if very well we know it, this uh, Purple Line is going to um, boost the growth and investment in the areas where it goes through. It, it also going to produce some gentrification, right? Uh, what's what's your view in, in that uh, in that concern? That is a very important point. And my vision for the corridor is that it will always be a place with affordable housing and an inclusive corridor where everyone can be able to be able to live. Uh, the way that we're going to achieve that goal is by buying having the county or having nonprofit organizations buying a lot of the housing that is there and then owning it over the long term and ultimately redeveloping it. So if you have a garden style community that has 500 you know, apartments in it now, there is no protection now that those you know, homes will be affordable five years from now or 10 years from now because they're privately owned. And what I think we ought to do is have the county provide financing for nonprofits to purchase those buildings. And then over time, we can redevelop them. So instead of 500 homes there, we could have 1,000 or 1,500 homes. And then a lot of them will be set aside permanently as affordable. So there, this is a vision of social housing, of having an affordable and inclusive corridor where there is affordable housing, not only in, in Silver Spring, but also in Bethesda, you know, and so that all of that area, if, if it's going to succeed, it has to be open to everybody. You know, if we want to attract companies to locate there, if we want students to be able to live there, there has to be affordable housing. And I think this is the best way for us to provide it. Right. And affordable housing, as you mentioned, is really important in, in this case. And uh, there's also there was also an approval to move forward on uh, giving the chance to, to uh, Metro to also build high rises uh, around the metro station, some of the metro stations to also improve the sustainability of the red line. What, what are your views on, on, on this aspect? 
Thank you. Uh, one of the proposals I worked very hard this year and we passed and the, you know, the county executive opposed it, but the council uh, supported it unanimously was to deal with the fact that at our metro stations in Montgomery County, we have empty parking lots or we have parking lots. They're not empty. They're full of cars, but we have parking lots. Uh, we don't have tall buildings. We have tall buildings next door, you know, up the street, but on the metro station properties, we have no development. And the reason is because it costs a lot of money to build on top of Metro. You have to have special engineering for the station access. Usually you have to build a new parking garage. So before you ever even start to put up a building on a Metro station property, you might have to spend 30, 40, 50, or even $100 million on other infrastructure. As a result, nothing happens. There is not a single Metro station property you know, right over the station in the county where you see any development happening now. And it hasn't happened for 30 years, you know, 40 years now. So I'd like to change that. The way that I propose that we address part of that cost is by saying, if you build housing or, or office buildings on top of that, for the first 15 years, you don't have to pay the property taxes. Um, that is enough to help with the numbers a little bit and, and hopefully we will be able to actually get some development happening there. And then once the development comes in, then the county will be able to make a lot of tax revenue. You know, over the long term, the county will make a lot of tax revenue off of having development on top of the metro. But until we do something to support economic development there, it's just going to continue to sit the way it is. So um, right. I'm excited about this change. I think we're going to start hearing good news about potential development on top of metros. Um, and, uh, you know, I appreciate my colleagues for supporting it on the council. Right. I, I think that's going to bring a lot of jobs in the construction industry. And then after the construction is going to also bring a lot of jobs for all, this, all that retail and offices that will be in that location, as well as you mentioned, the homes that will be uh, able to, to be constructed in that area close to the metro you won't need to have a a vehicle to go uh to work to different places in the county or even dc you, you can just reach to the metro a few blocks away That's, we think uh, uh it, it could be as many as ten thousand homes uh on the metro stations all across montgomery county so as you said that's a lot of construction that's a lot of jobs that's it's a lot of housing and, and uh some of that housing will be permanently affordable housing as well Great, wonderful news. And then an, another uh, of your priorities are economic development. What can you tell us about that? You mentioned in your website about um, working on making the state uh, more of a place to live, work, drive here, um, help small businesses recover. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, first, let's talk about small businesses, which have been very hard hit by COVID-19. Uh, you know, Restaurants, personal services, hospitality, hotels, many of them are closed. And uh, the, the business owners have thousands and thousands of dollars of uh, you know, non-payment debt in their rent. Um, and I'm very worried that many of them will, will not be able to open, or if they do reopen, they will gradually sink from the debt. So we need to provide more grants and loans, uh, or really grants for small businesses to help them recover. But then we also need to accelerate our local economic development so that the small businesses are working in a community where, you know, there are people spending money and, and buying things. And we need more economic development in Montgomery County. It's just what has happened in the past couple decades is Northern Virginia, Fairfax, Arlington, Alexandria, they and NDC, all of the economic development in the region is happening over there now. And We've got to have it happening in Montgomery County. If we don't create jobs here, then you know that could be really bad for our families. So one of my strong priorities is how to create a stronger local economy here, not only through helping local small businesses recover, but you know we have NIH, we have FDA, we have HHS and NOAA and the Department of Energy We have some of the most powerful research organizations in the whole world located here is, you know, and I think we all know a lot more about NIH today than we did before COVID-19. Um, there is a lot of investment that's coming into companies 
that do uh, diagnostics and vaccinations and all. So I am working to get the county to support entrepreneurs who want to start businesses related to or coming out of the, the labs that we have here in Montgomery County. Any other community in the world would, would just die to have NIH here in Montgomery County. You know, we're lucky to have it, but we need to do a lot more to get advantage from that, to, to have new companies and more jobs coming out of it. And that's really been my, one of my top priorities uh, on the council, and it will be as county executive. Some of our uh, neighbors, like uh, Arlington County, uh, Fairfax County, they're pushing really hard on uh, bringing high-paying jobs through uh, technology companies. And uh, what do you uh, have the same view? Do you, do you think this this is also important to for the county to track uh, also tech companies to the county? And what will be your plan? Absolutely, uh, you know. We have to do a better job. If you look at some of the statistics, what you will see is that it used to be the number of new jobs in the region were basically split. You know, D.C. got about a third. Virginia got about a third. Maryland got about a third. Today, Northern Virginia has almost all the jobs. D.C. has some of the, some of the rest. And Montgomery County, Maryland has just a very small, small fraction. That's not what made this county a great place to live. You know, we've always had stronger job growth, and that's why people love being here. So we have to get serious about attracting companies like Microsoft and Google and Apple, uh, Amazon, you know, that tech sector. We also have to invest more in growth in our life sciences, or our health companies. You know, the good news is there is momentum now, especially around biotech and life sciences. Like we do have an opportunity to get more growth going here and, and more companies, more jobs, but we have to make a lot of other decisions right in order for that to be possible. So we've got to make the kinds of changes around housing. We've got to make the kinds of changes around transportation. You know, we've got to make the right kind of changes with our budget and taxes. If we can do all of those things right, then, as the momentum is growing, you know, we'll help to accelerate it. But if we just get stuck in our old ways, we're going to block that progress and it's not going to get the same kind of results. So that's the kind of focus that I'm going to bring to the job. And I think we're going to make a lot of progress. Right. Now, in, in education, uh, I just want to jump really quick to, to education. Now, education, the county has done a lot to improve um, and, and uh, you know, uh, build really strong uh, partnerships like uh, universities at Shady Grove, at University of Maryland, many of the different schools at the University of Maryland in one campus. There was a huge investment also on the new hospital in Montgomery uh, uh, College, Germantown campus. Um, we are we have seen so many uh, improvements in uh, schools, uh, you know, high schools, middle schools, uh, elementary schools in around the county. Uh, what's what will be your your priorities in education? Great question. Well, first of all, I think we have to uh, first focus on pandemic recovery in education. It's very it's, it's awful that students have not been inside the classroom for more than a year, and so a lot of students did not make as much progress in their curriculum as they should. And so we are going to need to be very very aggressive over the next several years to accelerate that learning and make sure that our students are, are graduating from high school, you know, having learned everything that they were supposed to learn. Um, but we also need to do more to create STEM or you know, science and engineering pathways. You know, we have a science and engineering economy, you know, whether it's the private sector or the public sector in this county, we are substantially uh, growing in areas of science and engineering. So, I would love to see, and I, I've been working and I will you know, do more to see programs in our high schools, in Montgomery College and in the universities at Shady Grove that create these talent pipelines or these pathways so that wherever you live in Montgomery County, whoever you are, uh, you know that there is a way for you to get access to a good paying job in our local you know, industries. Um, or if you wanna come here from across the world, 
you know, you also have a, a, you understand the way to get a job here in Montgomery County in our life sciences sector or in our technology sector. So I think we could do a lot more uh, working with our school system and our colleges to build those programs for our students. I, you know, we haven't done enough nearly over the years and it'll be one of my top priorities uh, to, again, support the growth of our companies. You know, they need to have access to those talented workers in order to feel confident that they can grow, that Montgomery County is a place where when they wanna hire 50 people, 100 people, 500 people, you know, they can find those workers here. And also so that our students, our kids, our young people know, you know, that they have a future and their future is here in Montgomery County. I think one of the themes for me is many of us are concerned that our kids don't have as much of a future here as we would want them to. You know, there's not enough jobs, housing is too expensive. They may go somewhere else to start their families, to start their lives. And we would love for them to have, I would love for my kids, we would all love for our kids to have the option to make, a, make Montgomery County their home. And if we don't do more to provide jobs and, and housing that's affordable, you know, we are not gonna be able to do that. Right. And now uh, there's also uh, the climate concern, climate policy. And uh, we already mentioned many things that impact positively to climate policy. We're talking about uh, the, uh, you know, housing and uh, affordability. So that people don't have to leave farther to work in, and live in, in, in Montgomery County. Uh, now we're talking about also the purple line that's going to improve also accessibility, be able to, mass transit is also in, helps on, on, you know, to fight climate uh, change. But what else can the county do and what, what would be your plan? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I think we should all take COVID-19 as a warning that the things that, that science is telling us that could happen, they very well could happen. You know, we have known that a pandemic with devastating consequences is a possibility and it happened. It happened. The same goes for climate change. The, the warnings that we're receiving about the devastating impacts of climate change can and will happen. They are, they are already happening. So we have to act now with great urgency. We have to do things that we never believed we would be willing to do if we're going to stop the worst outcomes from climate change, uh, from disrupting our lives. So I would like to see Montgomery County powering all of our homes and our office buildings with Uh, it, as fast as possible, even by 2030, 100% of our homes and office buildings powered by clean electricity because most of the pollution and the easiest pollution for us to get rid of, I think, is the coal-fired power plants and the, the gas-fired power plants. By substituting solar and wind for the coal and the gas, then every time you turn on a light switch, every time you plug in your phone, you're not creating pollution, but you're doing that, you're creating pollution today. So I think one of the solutions is for us to work with the farmers in Montgomery County. We have 30,000 or more acres of farmland in Montgomery County uh, to work with one third of our whole county set aside as, as farmland, to work with, sorry, 100,000 acres of farmland, one third of our county, to work with our farmers so that when they grow crops, crops they, are also, they also have solar panels in the fields. And we could actually power uh, a lot of homes, maybe all the homes in Montgomery County from locally generated solar energy. And I would like to find a solution that can protect the future of farming and also protect the future of the community and of the world by creating more solar here. And I, I did work on that. I had legislation before the county council that I passed, but it did not. It, unfortunately, there was so much opposition that the legislation is not effective. So if I'm elected county executive, I'm going to get back into that. I'm going to pass us a plan that can power this county with clean, green energy. Great. And now there's, um, I would like to, to close with the policy reform, I mean, uh, police reform. And uh, this is a very... Um, touchy subject. We know uh, this is a nationwide issue. Um, you mentioned on your website 
uh, to turn Montgomery County as a model to the nation and, uh, and in transparency and trust. What, what is your plan? Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, you know, we know that police officers provide vital services and our communities need to be safe and they need to be protected. Um, but we have a lot of issues in this community and, and, and nationally with, uh, over time, police officers who commit bad acts are not held accountable. Uh, they continue to be police officers who continue to do the work. And, you know, that needs to change. So one of the solutions is to change the rules inside the police department so that when officers uh, need discipline, that that discipline actually happens. You know, we have situations today where an officer will commit an egregious act and will remain for years on the payroll uh, without facing disciplinary action. And until we change that, you know, I think the, the public will ask, how do we know that we're safe? How do we know that police officers are the best police officers that we could have? Uh, another issue I'm working on is the police free schools, uh, creating school communities that rely upon um, counselors and uh, coaches and uh, teachers to work with students when they're having a challenge, you know, social workers when they're having a challenge to find a solution without criminalization, without uh, putting young people onto a path in the court system uh, that ultimately leads to a life in the court system. Um, so I think we have to create police-free schools as a, a model for having a broader community response that relies more upon health, mental health, and social work whenever possible. And we know that there is going to always be a need for great police work, you know, police officers to fight crime, to solve crime. And we're going to continue to do that. We're going to invest in that. But we also need to be able to separate those kinds of response from response that is really social work, mental health, uh, community engagement. And if, when we can do that, I think we will get to the point that people feel once again that you know, the police officers are people that they can trust, uh, that they know that the department is, there is accountability and that indeed you know, the community that we live in, you know, we, we appreciate the police, and we support them. That's that's the that's where we want to be, and I know we can get there. And I think our department can really be a national example of how to achieve that goal. Thank you, Hans, uh, for this chance to talk to you and uh, everyone to hear more about your priorities and your history. Now, uh, is there anything else you would like to add to everyone watching you today? Well, uh, thank you for the interview. Um, I, I think there. I guess I, I just want to close close by encouraging everyone, please get vaccinated. You know, we are providing free vaccinations and very soon you'll be able to go to, you know, your doctor if you have a doctor you visit or your church or the drugstore. But COVID-19 is never going to end until everyone is vaccinated. And vaccinations really work, they're safe. Nobody really gets sick from vaccinations, but they get very sick from COVID-19. So please, Everyone, get vaccinated. You can contact me if I, I can absolutely provide you with uh, help getting an appointment, um, or you can reach out to community organizations to do it. But uh, you know, we won't recover with jobs and small businesses and, and community well-being uh, fully until we get vaccinated, and you know that is so important. So please, everyone, get vaccinated. The vaccines are very effective; they work. And they're very safe. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, the best of, of the energy and luck for the, uh, uh, the coming elections. Uh, thank you, Hans Reamer, uh, county, uh, uh, well, uh, candidate to county executive of Montgomery County, Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Delfino. I'm really glad to be with you today. And uh, my best wishes to you. Thank you.